I'm going to show you the fundamentals of 3D printing in plastic in a process called Fused Deposition Modeling, or FDM, which is the standard way that hobbyists are 3D printing now. It starts with a plastic filament. In this case, we are using PLA. Uh, here, we pretty much exclusively use PLA. It's polylactic acid because it's a uh, inexpensive, easy to use, very available material. Uh, in fact, it is made of corn syrup, so it is also biodegradable. Uh, another type of material that is commonly used is ABS, but ABS has uh, off-gassing of volatile organic compounds, which are not healthy for you. It's also more difficult to use, as a tendency to peel up. Uh, you may choose to investigate what else is out there. PETG is popular, and there's various specialty filaments which uh, have lots of unique properties, like glowing in the dark, or multiple colors, or even embedded metals, or uh, carbon fiber. This filament travels up here through a guide tube, and there's a motor, a special type of motor called a stepper motor. And what it does is it will move in very specific, very small steps in order to uh, push the filament down. Inside this head, there is a little uh, area that has some texture that's attached to the motor. So when that turns, it pushes the filament down. It's pushed against this bearing, and that way it's kept tight and then pushed further into the hot end. The hot end is this part. It has a block where there's a heating element. That heating element will bring it up to temperature. There's another wire that knows what temperature it is, so it can regulate that temperature and melts the plastic. The melted plastic is pushed down into this nozzle where there's a fine tip. You can, in fact, get different nozzles with different tips, but as a beginning uh, 3D printer, you're probably going to use what is just defaulted on the printer. The way this works is the plate on this one will move back and forth. Other models may move the whole head around. Uh, the plate will move back and forth in this direction, and the head will move in this direction, therefore laying out just one layer of whatever three-dimensional model you want to build, and then it will move up one notch on the z-axis or the vertical axis and it will print a, another version of that layer. You can think of it like a hot glue gun and if you're going to make a cylinder you might make a circle and then you'd lift it a little bit and make a circle and make a circle and make a circle and then eventually you end up with a cylinder. Very much that's the same principle here but it varies each of the layers in order to make whatever shape you would like. Uh, this printer happens to have its control board powered by the USB, so whether it's on or off, uh, as far as the heaters and the power and everything else, uh, you see a monitoring system here. One tells you what the hot end temperature is, the other tells you the plate. The reason the plate has a temperature is because the plates are also heated. This helps to uh, stop curling that would happen as the filament cools and shrinks a little bit and then ruins its adhesion, it pulls up from the plate. By heating the plate, you get a more consistent, better connection and therefore it's less likely to come loose and ruin your print. So I'm going to turn the power on on this printer. The power is just back here with the switch. It's going to turn on some fans, turn on the lights, but we are going to actually control it through a computer system. Here, we're using something called Octopi, which is running off Raspberry Pis, which are very small computers. They're connected to the, the back and can command this to uh, run through all of the various uh, functionalities that it has. We still do have control at the screen here uh, less commonly used, but we can go back to the information screen. We can uh, home the device, for example, just by turning the knob. And I can press home. 
It's going to find what are called its limit switches. There's little switches that get triggered when the mechanism hits. That's how it knows it's stopped. We've calibrated it. So this now is home or its starting position. Uh, I could go through and jog it in all of the directions. I could also heat the pad or the hot end and do some other functions. Instead, I'm going to do it on the computer. On a label, on the printer, is a website address. That website address for the printer we were just using happens to be octopi1.makehaven. It's going to load up the uh, web interface, and I can check that it's connected. So right under here on connected, or on connection, you can see that it gives me the option to disconnect, which means it's connected. Uh, so I don't need to do anything about that. I can further confirm by going to this control screen, and I can see if I can control the printer. So I'm going to click move to the side, and you can see as I click, we are jogging, and so I, ha I clearly have control of this printer. Well, we don't want to just move it around. We want to get, a, get it a set of instructions. And for that, we're going to have to deliver it something called G-code. And G-code is a simple set of instructions. It is actually coordinate numbers that outline exactly where the head needs to be and whether it needs to be pouring plastic or not. If you open up the file, you can see the coordinates and the temperatures written out, and it's following those instructions, much like a player piano is simply following the instructions of the musical notes that need to be played, rather than understanding the concept of music. How we create that G-code is we give it a three-dimensional model. So I'm going to go to a website called Thingiverse. Thingiverse is a directory of all sorts of objects that people have made themselves. And you can browse through by topic. And there's something related to almost anything uh, you can imagine. A good place to start is just to look at either their popular or their featured objects. Some of these are going to be complex. Some of these are going to be multiple parts. Uh, and some of these can actually have uh, articulated pieces. So this is an articulated butterfly, which although it prints as one single piece, you don't have to assemble it, it has uh, hinges built into the three-dimensional uh, print. So when you brick take it out, it will move and flex. Uh, those are pretty advanced as far as design. You can see this is one other example that one of our members printed. The blue feet were printed separately and assembled, but this white main part of the body you see here was printed as one object, and only once we pulled it off did we move it, it sort of cracks, and it comes apart. So a lot of great examples of sophisticated types of models you can find on Thingiverse. I'm gonna I see that it has a lot of comments, it has a lot of people who have made it. Uh, I can go to the thing files, and it's going to give me some, some options. In nearly every case, you're going to see a file type called an STL. An STL is like the JPEG is to a Photoshop file. It's a final version that maybe the people that like to edit and use all of the capabilities of their CAD software, their design software, wouldn't like to use as a starting point. But it's a, it's a format that's portable and easy to move around to different places. What it does is it creates a whole bunch of triangles and essentially wraps whatever object is in that design software uh, in those triangles. So it's just really the skin. Uh, sometimes you'll see that people include their original design files, and they can be associated with a lot of different software programs. And then if you wanted to modify it, you would have all of the internal uh, pieces that make it up and therefore be able to make changes. But I'm just going to go ahead and download one of these articulated butterflies. Uh, the top one, I have the STL downloaded. I'm going back to our 
page, which is our Octopi page for the printer, I'm going to grab this file. I could also grab it from a folder or download it to the desktop. Anywhere I can grab that file, I'm going to drag it and I'm going to drop it to upload locally, uh, which means the to the memory on the system. And it's going to do a little bit of thinking. Uh, one slightly confusing element is the uh, progress bar is down here, often just off of your screen view. So if you're wondering if it's processing something, you can check down here where the progress bar is. Uh, it will give me a three-dimensional preview of what I want to print. It will also allow me to resize. So if I wanted a smaller butterfly that would take less time, I can make it uh, half the size, or I could scale it up but we're going to leave it at just uh, the original scale. Sometimes, because STLs do not typically have a scale embedded in them, they will uh, come in as very, very tiny objects, and that's because either millimeter or inches have been mixed up. And so you can just look at what the conversion between millimeters and inches is and add that factor into the scale here. You can even add multiple objects and then arrange them. Uh, and there's some more advanced tools here. I'm uh, happy with how our butterfly is placed, so I'm going to go down and look at our options. Uh, we're using Cura Engine, which is the slicer. That's the thing that's going to take our just three-dimensional shape and it's going to break it into those layers. We are slicing for PLA, uh, so it's going to that's setting the various temperatures that are required for it. When it creates our G-code file, it's going to be called Articulated Butterfly, so it'll be easy for us to find in the file system. Uh, we're printing to the s squared printer, which is the name of that printer over there. And once we have a slice, it's going to say do nothing. So I'm going to leave it that way so I can show you how to find your file. But often I'll say either start printing or select for printing, so I don't have to go through and find the file that I just sliced. If you look in the basic tab of this slicer, you'll see that there's the printer temperature, uh, there's the bed temperature, the layer height, which is how far it steps up, the infill density, uh, shell thickness, which is, if you imagine a skin, the skin being wrapped around it, how many layers of skin are going around before the gets to the internal parts, the speed, the top to bottom, most of these you're not gonna change. Occasionally, you will change the infill amount. So looking at this, it says 30%. That's awfully dense. Um, so that's using plastics. You can see this honeycomb. Using plastic and weight that we may not need to, I would be perfectly happy with about a 20% fill. So I'm gonna change this to 20%, even though it would be fine otherwise. And I'm not going to change anything around supports. So, what case would supports be important? The, uh, the fact is that the printer prints from the bottom up. So if you had a figure that had an arm that was loose, the, it would not be able to print the hand before it printed the shoulder because it's starting down here. The solution is to build something called a support and it would be a little tower that comes up and it touches the tip of the fingers, so when it gets to the fingers, it's building on some sort of base. What happens when you build without supports is that you get this droopy, stringy uh, look. This model would be printed with supports underneath, which were then broken away afterwards, and therefore we had a foot that worked. Overhangs will work to some extent uh, this is an example of a model that uh, we were using to test how far of an angle that you can get to go over before it fails. And you can see we went a long ways, but it started to get stringy uh, after about 65 or 70 degrees. And if you sustain an angle more than 45 degrees, it is likely to get stringy or you're at least risking that stringiness. Having gone through those, we're not going to go through advanced, other than to mention there's something called adhesion. Adhesion is, uh, these are additions to your model 
that prevent curling of the corners or picking up of your model. Uh, by default, we leave what's called a brim on. And what a brim is, is you can think of the brim of a hat. It's a uh, thin uh, uh, layer around the perimeter just to give it some extra surface area only on that first layer. The other option, if you're having trouble, especially for delicate models that uh, don't have a lot of area that touches the plate, would be to use what's called a raft. And a raft is a whole platform that it builds underneath the model and then it builds the model on top. Uh, so it will bind to that. Uh, a raft is a more significant investment of plastic, so we're just gonna stick with brim. I'm gonna go back to general. I'm gonna go down here to where it says slice it. And it's going to, in the progress meter, uh, tell us how far it's gotten through the slicing process. This one went pretty fast because it's a relatively simple model, but your mileage may vary. I want to find my uh, G-code file that I just created, so I'm going to start typing articulated. Uh, you can see that the STL is there. And we have articulated GCO, which is our G-code file, and our STL. Occasionally, somebody will have selected show only machine code files, which are G-code, or show only model, fi model files. So if you don't see what you're looking for, come in here and take a look for uh, if one of those are selected, therefore hiding part of what you want. So having located our files, you can click the load button or the load and print button in order to bring your file up here. Uh, if you've just clicked the load button, you click the print button to initiate the printing process. Uh, two items of note are, it gives you an approximate print time, so you know how long it will take for your print to happen. And it gives you the length in meters of the filament that you will be consuming during this process. Uh, at Makehaven, we have a 30 meter courtesy amount per day uh, that members can use, and after that, we ask people to reimburse for the cost of the filament. At about 30 meters, it's a little less than 10% of a roll, which costs about uh, $20, $25. So uh, 3D prints are relatively inexpensive through this medium, yet uh, large prints do add up, so we ask people to replace the cost of that material for us. I'm going to get, take a look at the G-Code viewer. It's analyzing it, and I'm going to go up, and it's going to show me what my first layer looks like. I can even look at the progress of that layer. You can see how the software designed a path that adds up to that first layer being painted in, and then we move to the next layer. And the next layer is painted in in a similar fashion. This is a good way to go through and validate that the 3D model that you've put together and the supports and everything is coming out in the way that you imagined. Uh, when this is done, it will have gone through 51 layers of material. When I clicked print, uh, it also started going through a process of heating up. You can see that there's two red lines here. One is the target temperature for the bed, or for the hot end. Uh, then the dark red is the actual temperature. So it moved following the target, it came up, it's bounced a little bit, and it's hovering at the target temperature. The blue line is for the bed. So the bed is a little slower, which is typical on these. It's a little bigger than the hot end, and it's rising the temperature to meet the target. Once those are both up at the top, the 3D printer will initiate its printing process. And we ask you to stick around for the at least the first layer moving into the second layer to be sure that that printer has actually got a good foundation. After which, you can take off, uh, come back later, and see your print finished. Uh, other people may in fact have removed your print 
Uh, so we ask that you put the label on somewhere on the printer. So if there's a problem, we know uh, who to go to to mention that problem. And then the sticker can be transported to your finished object when the uh, print is done. When removing a print, you simply are taking a scraper like this that is stored over here with some of the other tools used for the 3D printer, and you are applying it and scraping it up off the plate. One thing to note is if it's difficult to remove and the plate is still hot, you might want to wait until the plate has cooled down uh, and some of that shrinking has happened, which can make it easier to pull that off of the plate. Uh, I will say that it is often quite difficult to get the plastic off the plate. I'm now going to watch to see that the plastic is coming out and being pushed or making uh, contact with the top. It should be uh, not completely circular, but pushed on like toothpaste on a toothbrush uh, in order that it binds to that surface and it does it pretty much evenly everywhere. If that's not happening, the most likely problem is that the bed has not been leveled. Now bed leveling is not something that we're gonna get into as a process now, but just to understand that if that is not the exact right distance for, for where it's pouring the plastic, that plastic can cool too much before adhering, or that nozzle can be so close that it's blocked from being able to pour out the plastic and therefore the plastic can't come out. Uh, in this case, it looks like we have a nice, even uh, flow of filament, and we are probably gonna be fortunate with our first layer. I'm gonna watch this till it moves up to the next layer, just to be sure that everything's going very well, but this is a, a great start because it's nice and even. What I would do is I would could deposit, particularly in an envelope noting it, the uh, amount owed in this box here, or I could go on the Makehaven website to makehaven.org slash store, and on that site is a list of lots of materials that we have made available for member convenience, and you can see that there's 3D printer fil uh, filament PLA, and simply an add to cart will take you to PayPal where you can uh, check out online adding however many uh, meters you've consumed. If you find that the exploration of Thingiverse and the objects in there are, uh, are limiting and you want to go beyond that, you may choose to, in fact, do your own designs. Uh, one great starting point for people who are maybe not super familiar with uh, CAD is Tink Tinkercad. Uh, this is a piece of design software which uses basic geometric shapes that you can add and subtract. And if you investigate it more deeply, you can actually import various shapes and extrude them and even use uh, these calculated or programmable shapes. So you can go a pretty long ways with Tinkercad. Uh, when you hit the end of Tinkercad, you may use Fusion 360, SolidWorks, or other software. Uh, but if you're just beginning, coming here and going to the Learn tab, where you walk through various tutorials, is a great way to learn how to create your own models and get into the world of 3D printing. So that's all I have on 3D printing. Good luck with designing and printing your models.